Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! That, um, uh, the shouting of Daesh, the uh, backdrop of crisis in continental Europe, um, all add to the febrile atmosphere, but we'll confine ourselves to facts. Facts are a priest has been killed, the attackers were armed with knives, and the anti-terrorist police are now uh, running the investigation, so not really much room there for doubt about what sort of attack we are looking at. But as I say to you a billion times, the conversation now doesn't become one about the people responsible for this hideous crime, it becomes one about the people not responsible for this hideous crime, who uh, enjoy a similar background. And there's nothing you can do about that. If you need proof positive of how powerful that observation is, you need only look at Donald Trump in America and, and the notion that when a terror attack occurs in France, it's proof that he shouldn't let French people into America. He said that at the weekend. You may not have noticed because of the weirdest way in which this uh, um, uh, story is being reported or, or, or this election is being reported it, it's it's for me proof positive that we're so far down the rabbit hole now we've forgotten what day it is he, he genuinely said we, we'll have to ban French people not Muslims it was bad enough when he said we're going to ban all Muslims from America he genuinely said um, after Nice that they would have to contemplate banning all French people from France and people are still cheering him it's almost as if it's almost as if reality and perception are now so completely at odds that you have to pick a side you, you can no longer try to ride both horses you can no longer try to say well look, this is reality but this is what some people somewhat oddly believe we're gonna have to try and find a way of, of, of bringing the people who believe their perceptions more than they believe reality back into the into the fold but I don't know how you do that and if you needed more proof of what was going on here well I, I can't you know I don't do someone's just tweeted me a picture of a bloke in a Tim Four hat saying I'm getting ready for the next hour on LBC I don't know if this is Tim Four hat territory to be honest with you as far as I can tell nobody is disputing the um, Democrat Aides who are essentially briefing that, briefing that two Kremlin-linked intelligence groups were behind an email hack that has, well, caused quite a lot of problems for the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia. I, I just want to run that by you again. Two Kremlin-linked intelligence groups, codenamed, just when you thought things couldn't get any more surreal, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear, are behind an email hack that threatened to tip the Democratic Convention into chaos. So you need to go back over a year. I'm trying to think what question I'm going to ask you. And do you know what? I'm, I'm toying with the idea of just asking whether you believe it. Toying whether or not you believe it. it. I believe it. It seems to me to be fairly obvious that Vladimir Putin, his position in the world would be enormously enhanced if you had a complete clown like Donald Trump in the White House. But significant swathe of the population don't think he's a complete clown. We're back to perception versus reality. It's incredible. It's a man who's expressed sexual interest in his own daughter about how if he didn't happen to be her father, he's pretty sure he'd fancy her. A man who's described war heroes as being somehow cowardly because they actually got taken prisoner in Vietnam. A man who suggested you can't let any French people into it. It's absolutely unbelievable where we are now. But this story to me seems to represent possibly one of the new boundaries that we're about to break through. These emails proved, just to stick with the conspiracies for a moment, what Bernie Sanders supporters had long claimed, that the whole primary process was rigged, that people in the Democratic Party leadership at the very top of the organization actively not just wanted, but agitated for a Hillary Clinton victory. And the emails have been leaked. So, I mean, part of the problem they've got is that they are guilty. They're guilty of what they were accused of. They're guilty of agitating for um, a Hillary Clinton victory over Bernie Sanders. 20,000 emails from the party's own servers, accessed over the course of a year by hackers, revealing without really any room for, for argument that Democrat officials who should have been neutral during the presidential primary actually plotted against 
Bernie Sanders. That's a given, okay? So that's one problem that we probably need to discuss. The fact that they did prove, if you like, what Bernie Sanders supporters were saying all along. They show, amongst other things, um, party officials uh, considered using Bernie Sanders' religious beliefs against him. It's just sort of ways that how can we stop Bernie? That was the general theme of the emails. And it in part explains why when Bernie Sanders stood up yesterday and called upon his supporters to support or vote for Hillary Clinton, he got booed. So you've now got the defeated Democratic nominee being booed when he suggests that his voters should transfer their allegiance to the victorious Democratic nominee. Mr. Clinton's campaign chairman spent yesterday morning pushing this theory that the hackers were linked to Putin. I, I just want to know whether or not you believe that. Don't forget Mr. Trump has already said that if he were president, America might not honour its NATO commitments. If Russia attacked a Baltic state, um, he wouldn't necessarily obey the terms of the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation unless the state under attack had given enough money to NATO. Uh, the security company that discovered the hack has said that the groups behind it, the two groups behind it, both engage in extensive political and economic espionage for the benefit of the government of the Russian Federation. So the security company that has found the hack support the idea that it is effectively Kremlin-backed. How high up at the Kremlin it would go, I do not know. I really don't. But you can't help thinking that it probably went quite high up. And what they're doing now is actively interfering in the election of a sovereign country, of America in this case, albeit they're interfering with emails that prove bad behaviour was committed, but I find this absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. At what point in our history did we not <sighs> respond with almost, almost disbelief to the idea that the Kremlin are trying to help Donald Trump win the American election? I, do you know what? I still can't quite go all the way over the line on this one. I, I still can't quite believe it. 0345 6060973 oh, is the number you need. Do you believe it? And if you do, why is this not the end of the line for Trump? It's astonishing, really, to reflect upon the fact that the country which pretty much led the West to victory in the Cold War country which pretty much caused the collapse of the old Soviet Union in, in, in obviously conjunction with Mikhail Gorbachev, Perestroika and Glasnost. The country that really for much of the 70s, the 80s, actually go far back as the 50s, the post-war period of 20th century geopolitics effectively saw America living in constant fear and suspicion of Russia. And in the flick of a finger, We've reached a place where the Russian regime can apparently be trying to influence the American election and Americans are cheering them along. Donald Trump fans are supremely untroubled by this. Ed points out, I'm sure the US has never intruded in the elections of another democratic country. You're quite right. I'm not here to suggest that the uh, American history is one of non-intervention or non, uh, not seeking to influence the political situations in other countries. But I'm absolutely absolutely fascinated as to how you would account for this astonishing state of affairs. Uh, Russian intelligence agencies actively seeking to damage one candidate in the American election and therefore help the other one. Just talk to me, seriously, because I am completely bamboozled by this story, more than I have been than I think any other in recent months. And my God, we've been talking together about some pretty strange stories in recent months. This surely is the strangest one of all. Uh, even stranger than yesterday's conversation about the Russians putting fake mouse holes in laboratories in Sochi during the Winter Olympics so that they could swap urine samples. What do, just, uh, I know I should have a more sophisticated question than this, but I don't. What do you think is going on? 03456060973. Russian backed security services can interfere in the American election apparently to favour Donald Trump, and nobody really seems to be screaming about it. That's incredible, isn't it? Or maybe I'm the one that's gone mad. It's 12.15. It's, it's uh, probably the clumsiest question I've ever asked you, and my God, I've asked you some clumsy questions over the years, but what on earth? 
is going on in America. <laughs> Clinton aides insisting with some evidence that Vladimir Putin, or at least Russian intelligence organizations, Russian Kremlin-linked intelligence groups, have hacked the Democratic Party servers, their main computer host, if you will, accessed, stolen, in fact, nearly 20,000 emails, and released them in the hope, one has to presume, of damaging Hillary Clinton's presidential bid. And Donald Trump, who is supposed to be the sort of isolationist, uh, quote, patriotic, end quotes, candidate, getting a massive boost from Vladimir Putin, and nobody's batting an eyelid. The, 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 I just want you to explain it to me. I genuinely, I genuinely today look at this story with a sense of utter bafflement. Utter bafflement. And I think it possibly proves nobody knows what's going on anymore. 20 minutes after 12, we have a much better idea of what has gone on in Normandy this morning than we did last time. We spoke to LBC's correspondent in Paris, Stéphane de Vries, but he's here again now to bring us up to date with the very latest. I know that anti-terror police have assumed control of the investigation, Stéphane. <laughs> This is being considered a new terrorist attack on French soil. The French president, François Hollande, has arrived on the site, as has the Home Minister, Bernard Cazeneuve. Um, currently, the site is being investigated by sniffer dogs to find if there are, to, to verify if there are any explosives. And for the time being, there's no clue whatsoever about the identity of the attackers, mm -hmm. nor about their motivations. We had some reports, the Daily Telegraph, I think quoting Le Figaro, I could be wrong, that one of them had apparently shouted Daesh during the commission of the attack. Does that not tally with your sources? Yes, this was um, reported by some French media, but the journalist reporting this has withdraw, uh, withdraw, withdrew his remarks. Um, apparently, uh, they have shouted something that could be, uh, as the media are saying now, uh, some correct characteristic shouts uh, linked to Islamist terrorists. So it's extremely vague. Um, the police has, has not confirmed this nor denied this. They are simply investigating the identity of the two attackers who have been killed uh, by the police uh, when the police raided the church. And do we know any more yet about the priest um, who was killed apparently by them? No, he was just uh, that he was uh, called Jacques Hamel, an 84-year-old priest uh, in the small town of Saint-Étienne-du-Rouvray, which is near Rouen in the west of the country. Um, not much is known. At the moment of the ta attack, two um, sisters were also, uh, two religious sisters were also inside the church as uh, three worshippers. Uh, one of the women was able to escape the church and was able to alert the police, who uh, was almost immediately uh, on the site with the uh, arrest uh, teams, heavily armed arrest teams. Uh, as you understand, Paris and uh, France in general is on a very high level of alert since the attacks in January last year in Paris. Uh, so all um, everywhere in the country, in, in, in uh, larger cities, there are arrest teams and, and also soldiers um, are on standby to intervene whenever there is a new attack, as was the case this morning. Stefan de Vries, many thanks indeed. As Stefan suggested, as more details emerge, we will bring them to you. 84-year-old priest killed by men armed with knives. Anti-terror police now leading that investigation in northern France, just south of the city of Rouen. Uh, more on that as and when it happens. The time now is 23 minutes after 12. The question is, uh, it's as simple as it is complicated, actually. Uh, uh, unbelievable. Um, it is pretty much established that this uh, intelligence group is affiliated to Russia Russia's main intelligence directorate. No one is really disputing that. And they have stolen tens of thousands of emails from an American political party servers, released them. They're embarrassing emails. I think it's important to bear that in mind. The, the, the Democratic uh, workers, uh, party workers were doing something they categorically should not have done. But the idea of Americans sitting by while Russians interfere in their internal politics, ten, five even years ago, would have been We've been talking about World War Three. Now we're just sort of sitting there going, blimey, this election's a right old humdinger, isn't it? Jeremy's in Crowthorn. Jeremy, what would you like to say? No, James, of Hello. course it's not true. Um, if you look at when the Americans are um, looking at uh, overseas elections, a big indicator for them is they look at any discrepancy between the exit polls and the actual results. Any discrepancy of 2% or more 
they say that election, you know, it's it's rubbish. In the DNC primaries, James, they were suffering um, discrepancies of up to 19% and always in Hillary Clinton's favour when this was brought to the attention of the uh, the election adjudicators, etc. Their reaction was, really? Well, OK, don't worry about it. We'll look into it. Uh, well, it's a slight, slightly <laughs> different interpretation for, from the one I've got. But where, where do you think WikiLeaks got all these emails from then? Well, they, they, the old expression is, give a man a mask, he'll always tell you the truth. I mean, they, they, do, get, they do get it from um, whistleblowers, don't they? So they, they, they didn't get it from these two intelligence groups, Cozy Bear well, and Fancy Bear, because the, the, the fingerprints you know, are pretty irresistible. They, they, there's evidence of the Cyrillic script employed on the computers used the, being removed from the second tranche of releases. It's a, I mean, I, there's, there's a slight, slight tone in your voice. I don't know whether it's genetic or whether it's deliberate. There's, there's, no, there's, evi there's no evidence, James. But I've just there's told you what the evidence is. is. How's that? You've got evidence that it didn't not happen. Evidence. It's hearsay. No, it's not. It's... it's it's not hearsay. Hearsay is what you just did. Hearsay is saying, well, I've heard this thing and it must be true. Evidence is saying, here is the detail provided by the FBI and the State Department that shows the fingerprints, if you like, of uh, hackers who are clearly Russian and demonstrating a modus operandi and some IP links that tally with previous attacks that were definitely Kremlin-backed. That's evidence. Well, you did the hearsay. If you, if you want to believe it, James, I think you will live to be embarrassed by it. So, really just do. to run through who's lying, so the Russians are, 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 are the not... The Clinton campaign have been caught with their pants down and so they're going... Yes, but how? Is the, the question, blame, Jeremy, is I'm how? I'm explaining to you. How have I'm they been caught? To what they're... Because the emails have been leaked. By who? Well, it's been published on WikiLeaks, hasn't it? And where did they get it from? Ask them. <laughs> I, I have. They said Russia. Well, what did they say? I... I doubt it. I think you're listening to the Clinton campaign when you're saying that. Okay. Mark is in Dublin. Mark, what do you reckon? Can we try and be a little bit more sensible than the last fella? I'll, I'll do my best, James. Thank, Thank you, you very much for taking my call. Um, yeah, I just want to chip in on, on this conversation and just say maybe there's a, a bigger point. Um, if it's true that uh, the, you know, the, the Russian hackers are involved, um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. But um, So I, I, I'm prepared to believe it's true. I just don't know. But um, what, what, what I would just like to say is, I wonder what it would take for uh, Trump, support, Trump supporters. What kind of story would it take for them to to stop and think? That's the question I should have asked, right isn't it? Well, you just heard Jeremy, though. I don't know if he's a Trump supporter. I shouldn't misrepresent him now that he's gone. But um, let's presume he was. Maybe I am misrepresenting him now that he's gone. Well, the answer is the Trump supporters don't need to believe it because they can say it's just hearsay. It's proof that Hillary Clinton is even more... Quite how is proof that Hillary Clinton... The fact that Hillary Clinton's been busted doing something wrong in some emails hacked by Russians prove that she wasn't hacked by Russians. That's what they'll say. Yeah. You just heard it here first. And I think, I think as well, the whole tone, it just makes me so sad. Um, I know it sounds very naive and I sound like a bit of a hippie, but it's just, it's, it's so hateful. Uh, the whole discourse has become so hateful and so vulgar. Um, after Michelle Obama's speech, and again... Amazing speech. I respect, yeah, I think so too, but I respect the fact, you know, not everyone's an Obama supporter. But, you know, that's, that's what, you know, kind of makes me think of the Kennedys again. I know that um, sounds a bit naive and so on. But um, just some of the comments uh, I saw after her speech, I was, I was looking at it on uh, YouTube, and I've no, of course people can disagree with her points, her content, but it's just, there's so much visceral hatred directed at human beings. Um, you know, like for example, I don't hate Donald Trump as a human being because I don't know the man. It would be ridiculous for me to hate him, but people are so prepared to hate what they don't necessarily... But I don't know, you can hate with. some of the things Donald Trump has done. I would have thought maligning sure. John McCain, sure. who, who, who was held prisoner in grim mm -hmm. circumstances by uh, the Viet Cong, and I think refused to leave mm -hmm. unless he could take his men with him. You, you, you could hate him for that. You could hate him for uh, some of the allegations that have been leveled against him with regard to, to mafia links and employing illegal immigrants and exploiting the workforce. There's an astonishing story about one of his casinos, just from a piano supplier, of all things. A bloke who gave them a hundred thousand pounds worth of pianos, didn't get paid, got a call three months later saying, casino's not making as much money as we hoped, 
Egypt. You can either wait until we are or we'll pay you 70,000 bucks and you can suck up the 30,000 pound difference. So, I, I mean, there's a million reasons not to like the fella, but you're describing prejudice. You're describing people who don't like Michelle Obama because she's black or because she's a woman. I'm afraid so, yeah. Well, that's where we are now. I, 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 is, is that what it is then? Is that, is that when these blinkers come off? As it, as they blinkers? I, when the blinkers go on, I should say. When the blinkers go on and you're indulging ancient prejudices and phobias or call them whatever you want, then everything goes. The, the rationality and reality have completely gone out of the window. So Trump supporters will either go into peak denial and say this has got nothing to do with the Russians or, and I can't believe I'm about to say this out loud, they will actually go down that, well, I'd rather be on, in bed with Putin than crooked Hillary. They'll go down that road. Yeah, it, I it's, uh, I mean, again, it's hard to believe this is actually the news, and it's hard to believe this is real. Every story. It, it's such a pantomime. Isn't it? But, and, uh, and, and this yeah. is, of course, the search for the leader of the free world. That tiny little finger is hovering over the nuclear button. Got time for a couple more calls on this. 03456060973 is the number that you need. Just to clarify, a few of you are pointing out that the so-called Islamic State absolutely hate being described as Daesh, so it's highly unlikely that any terror attack undertaken in the name of Islamic State would shout that out. The journalist who made that original claim has withdrawn it now, although the uh, report remains in place that there were slogans shouted or, or, or comments made by these attackers that have here to tally with the notion of support for Islamic State. As I said, the speculo the thing is, what happens now on a story like this is you give people details and facts and they complain that you're not adding extra detail to it, you're not reporting every rumour, you're not reporting, it's evidence apparently of bias or of some sort of attempt to, 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 to dilute the impact of the terrorism. What we know at the moment is that a priest got killed in horrible circumstances by two men who were neutralised by the police. One remains injured, one is dead. That is all that we know. The rest is hearsay. Obviously, people are going to put two and two together and make four in many cases. But the job of a journalist is not to do the sums until all of the numbers are in place. And at the moment, they're not. Just, I can't be able again, I suppose, given that we're talking about an American electorate untroubled by the idea of Kremlin interference in a general election. Perhaps we shouldn't be that surprised that over here in Britain, you have to explain why every wrinkle and rumour on social media doesn't get reported immediately by reputable news news organisations. I should probably have stuck in allegedly before that reputable. <laughs> it's 12.32. All the stranger then to reflect upon the situation in America, in America where the old threat of Russia has apparently dissipated to such a degree that highly reliable reports suggesting that Kremlin-backed intelligence agencies have essentially been seeking to help Donald Trump by embarrassing Hillary Clinton, embarrassing her, to be fair, by unveiling the behaviour of her supporters in the Democratic Party uh, upper echelons. But the idea that the Kremlin have done it and it leaves Trump supporters untroubled is... I, I, yeah, I keep using these uh, slightly um, hyperbolic words to describe my position, but they're accurate. I truly staggering, truly sta even by the standards of this campaign. The idea that they can say, "Yeah, the Kremlin are helping," and Trump supporters cheer. I, I, just, I just, just don't get it anymore. Phillips in Guildford. Philip, what's going on? Hello, good afternoon, TV. Yeah, no, I was just sort of reflecting on what you've been saying, and I was my conclusion really is that it, it comes to me as no great surprise. Um, I mean, I, I look back to the period that 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 Russia should take a very close interest in the outcome of the election, as they obviously would do, uh, and would seek to interfere and subvert by their uh, any means they can. Um, and well, that's, I think a that's, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. I mean, you go back to the Cold War and it was par for the course, wasn't it? I was just about to say that, James. Going back to the 1950s and 60s, I remember um, the, the CIA centre in Berlin uh, at the height of the espionage and bugging across the Berlin Wall used to work on the, on the, on the working assumption that they knew all of our secrets, but we, 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 we console ourselves in the knowledge that we know all of theirs. Um, so they take it as a given, um, and I, I, I don't really read too much into it. Oddly enough, I heard one of uh, the news reporters a few days ago making much, and I would completely agree with the mat with the matter of um, of Trump's um, signalling uh, about weakness on the issue of perhaps defending um, 
some of the NATO alliance in, in Eastern Europe, uh, the Baltic states in particular. Yes. And I think that's a very significant uh, uh, development. And I think that's something which um, obviously um, is of very great importance to the, the ongoing tensions between Putin and and the West. Um, because I have long felt that that um, uh, Putin is is uh, uh, presents a grave danger uh, to the NATO alliance. But do you and, know? And I don't know about the NATO alliance. He, well, he, he does. He does. I mean, he's, he's, he's stated it. It, it, it. It's there on the record. Now we know Indeed. Putin's imperial ambitions, and now you have Donald Trump saying, "Well, unless they've paid a, a, a lot of money into NATO, without presumably him knowing what the terms of the treaty are, then I wouldn't, as American president, necessarily ride to their rescue." Breaking the fundamental tenet of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, yeah. the, the thing that has kept the world close to peace for, for, since Jimmy the Second Rubin's World War. Case. Jamie, Jamie Rubin said uh, the other day, I listened to him on another program, saying that this was a, a tremendously damaging thing, actually damaging, uh, that, that, uh, that Trump had said. Um, and this was going to have, will definitely have consequences. Um, it, it, you, can't put, you, can't, you can't put the toothpaste back in the, the tube after you've squeezed it out. But it's the reaction that surprises me. Yeah, I think you've done a great job of reminding us why we probably shouldn't be that surprised. Albeit that the, albeit that the tone has, or the tactic has changed. It's unlikely that during the height of the Cold War, the Russians would have picked one of the two major parties in America and decided to help one to the detriment of the other. It's the lack of shock and surprise. This is the country that gave us the phrase Reds under the bed. They were paranoid. This is the nation of McCarthyism. The communism, the fear of communism even the suspicion that you might have met a communist once was enough to end your career in 1950s America. And now they've got the Kremlin effectively doing some dirty work on behalf of Donald Trump and Donald Trump's supporters. I don't know if they're comfortable with it, but they seem at best to be supremely unconcerned. I don't get that. It's, it's, um, it, they see, they see a Trump presidency as reverting back to um, pre-war, pre-World War uh, isolationism on the part of America, and that is very comforting to them, um, and that that maybe suggests um, uh, ex <laughs> active active interventionism intentions on the part of Putin in the future, and um, they don't want an internationalist presidency. Uh, on the other side of the pond, uh, 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 they see, and, and she has a reputation, Mrs. Mrs. Clinton. Of but why wouldn't the Trump? Why wouldn't a, a patriotic American be more troubled by the Kremlin interfering in their election? That's the thing I'm struggling with. I. You can't I, help I, me, I, can I, you? I, because we're down the rabbit hole. Because we're down the rabbit hole. We got we got military mi 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 military heroes who aren't heroes because they actually got taken prisoner. We got uh, uh, tax returns that aren't being published because the bloke is almost certainly hiding something huge. But the punters don't care because he's selling them something they can't get anywhere else. And it is, I guess, a sort of uh, a, a forlorn a hope that they might wake up in a different era, that they can somehow turn back time on the 21st century. 12.41 is the time. Jeff is in Red Hill. Jeff, what is going on? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I've got to agree with a lot that the, um, uh, the, the previous caller just said. Yes. Um, I think that, um, um, if it's of course true, um, I think that um, uh, Russia would be quite pleased with uh, a Trump uh, presidency. Um, um, as the previous caller did mention, um, uh, he, Trump is very isolationist. He, what, what, why do you think the Republican supporters aren't more freaked out by the possibility that the Kremlin yeah. is helping their man? Well, I, I think America's in a very, very, it's very turbulent at the moment. There's a lot going on there, and um, I think they're so caught up in this Trump thing and their elections coming up. That probably, it may well be that they, they just couldn't uh, care less at the moment about what Well, happened. I mean, that's, that's, that's the same question I'm asking. Why couldn't they care less? Why, how can we have arrived at a place in America? It's not a country I know brilliantly well, but I thought I was familiar with it, where the land of Reds under the bed of McCarthyism are unconcerned, or half of them are unconcerned, about Kremlin interference in their own election. It's almost the definition of things that would have caused epic, epic upset and outrage not that long ago. Time has just turned 12.43. The number you need, and you're going to have to be quick if you want to join in with this.
this conversation is 03456060973. Um, he's also enjoyed a bit of a bounce. He's overtaken Mrs. Clinton in some polls published yesterday. Historically, bounces after conventions are normal, but the, but the Republican convention was such a strange affair that I suppose there was no way of knowing one way or the other whether it would deliver a post-convention bounce. And this one is bigger than any scene since 2000. Then you've got the added problem of Hillary Clinton enjoying not satisfied approvement, approval ratings of 45% at the moment. Uh, last word on this, I think, to Paul, who's in Enfield. Paul, what would you like to say? Yeah, I think what should be more worrying to the established is not that <clears throat> what the antics being played with each other's uh, election campaign, but the amount of, of support that Trump is getting, not just in the US, but all over the world. I mean, I was in the city just earlier on. A number of people have said, oh, I hope he gets in. Yes. So there's a there's a huge, we're not talking about a, a minority or a significant minority, a huge chunk of the population the U.S., as well as people from all around, seems to, uh, well, Trump seems to have hit according them. And I think that should be more worrying than the antics has been played at. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, d I don't know if you're, uh, if you're, if you're criticising my topic choices on the programme this morning, Paul, but I have discussed the other elements um, several times in the past. I just found today it more interesting to reflect upon the country that lived in the shadow of reds under the beds for the best part of my life has now got reds in the bed and they're apparently uh, utterly untroubled by it. I find it almost impossible to understand. Almost impossible. Well, you know, maybe the passion for what they want, what their ambitions with Ashford are greater than the fact that the Reds are in the bed. Uh, yeah, you're but, right. You know, to, I guess you're right. Do, 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 I also have a suspicious feeling that, you know, he, the, Trump is this kind of an unarticulate version of Farage. But when it came to the crunch, you know, Farage didn't get in. But do you think it'd be different in the US that, that hey, because he's only got two candidates to pick from, you know, um, that he may somehow sneak in. And, and Hillary Clinton is a supremely unsympathetic candidate. She, she struggles to win over some core Democrat support, let alone the sort of new outlying, essentially highly liberal, ultra-liberal supporters of Bernie Sanders. Uh, and, and it, I mean, I enjoy politics watching. I enjoy election watching. But there's something about this election that feels really really dark and if i said now I, I did to make paul's point for him i'm quite scared by the notion of of somebody who appears to be playing from a fairly well-established quasi-fascistic playbook i find that quite frightening the people paul's talking about in this country are the ones who would tweet and text me saying good i'm glad you're frightened people like you are going to get what's coming to what's that? what do you mean people like me you know I've got people who don't think that you should be rounding up others according to their religion yeah people like you well people that that that, that kind of description of someone who doesn't think you should be treated differently under the law according to the colour of your skin or the circumstances of you. But yeah, people like you, you're going to be on the back foot soon with your who humanitarian outlook. And that seems to be, and, and you, you look at the numbers that Trump gets and you think, no, they can't all be buying into this. They can't all be buying into the notion that he's going to somehow make their lives better when all of his policies involve making other people's lives worse. It's so all he's got. What are you going to do? I'm going to make his life worse? Oh, good. That'll make me happy. Really? Why? I'm going to make his life worse, and I'm going to make his life worse. And her life, and all of them, and all of them, and none of them will be allowed into America. I'm going to make life rubbish for millions and millions of people. And somehow people hear those speeches and think, that means he's going to make life better for me. Fascism works, not because it makes life better for you, but because by making life worse for them, you somehow feel as if you're winning. It's 12.47. I'm uh, joined in the studio now by Paul Gilding, uh, an author and environmentalist and campaigner. In fact, you're one of those people, Paul, whose business card could probably run to about 16 different pages. Um, and we're going to discuss uh, a number of issues, not least sustainability and the notion that, that the world is running out of stuff. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a yeah. suit suitably yeah, layman good. way of describing things? But I want to begin mm -hmm. just by tallying with the conversation we were having just before with regard to Donald Trump, because um, all the other reasons to fear the fella... The environment barely gets a look in, which is why I was slightly taken aback by, by this clip that someone sent to me earlier. My hair look okay? Got a little spray. Give me a little spray. You know, you're not allowed to use hairspray anymore because it affects the ozone. You know that, right? I said, you mean to tell me, because you know, hairspray is not like it used to be. It used to be real good. No, in the old days, you put the hairspray on, it was good. Today, you put the hairspray on, it's good for 12 minutes, right? But, you know, they say that you can't. I said, wait a minute. So if I take hairspray and if I spray it in my apartment, which is all sealed and 
You're telling me that affects the ozone layer? Yes. I say, no way, folks. No way. Okay. And that is what you're up against. A great intellect indeed. Potentially, because his apartment is sealed. Mm. The cl chlorofluorocarbons? Yeah. I mean, the ozone isn't top of the list of uh, international emergencies anymore, but the, the, the f and this guy could be president of America. You've got yeah. a lot of work on your hands. Well, it, it's no question of that, but it's also this idea, isn't it? If I seal my apartment, if I seal my country, if I seal my mind from the world, it'll all be okay. Yes, exactly. And that. it's not. And that's, that's sort of part of this mentality of... I, people like him can't comprehend that it's all connected. And, and that's why this, this sort of lack of intellectual understanding of basic science has left us with people like that, uh, he's not alone, who believe that, how can I possibly affect the global planetary system? I'm too small, it's too big. And that's, that's where we've learned to change the way we think. Where does the mm -hmm. resentment come from, do you think? Because it's not just, I can't accept that I've played a role in these enormous mm. environmental movements. It's, I really hate being told that I have. Yeah. And, and it's a combination of things going on there. One of them is, is don't tell me how to behave. Yes, um, that's that, that's in sense of freedom. I have the right to carry a gun. I have the right to do anything is part of the issue. But secondly, it is, it is basic science that is not understanding how the system works and how what we do does affect people around us. And, and that connectedness, if you like, I think is one of the underlying issues. And I think in the case of someone like Trump and, and the United States, um, you know, it's, it's what I argue in my writing is that this is fundamentally how we live our lives, which is about the economy. And change is not always threatening. He sees change as threatening. I'm saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had oil-free cars that run electricity mm. that came from the sun, that was cheaper to run, and we had clean cities and we had more jobs, that'd be a better economy. And so I sort of approached the issue saying, this is a good idea. Having a cleaner environment is a good idea. We're going to be healthier. We're going to be happier. And, and they see it as a threat. Take away my coal jobs. Take away my lifestyle. You threaten me. And I'm saying, well, no, not acting threatens you. Fixing it up is actually good for you. This is the subject of your book, The Great Disruption, mm. and indeed the TED Talks that you do as you, as you travel the world trying to sort of encourage people to wake up to the reality of what you describe. If, if I was to try to put it into a sort of pithy little sentence, uh, your fear is, and, and you back it up with a lot of evidence that the notion of infinite growth is bogus yeah. we're going to run out of stuff if, if you have an economy based on stuff yeah. you by definition have to run out i mean the earth is limited physically and, yeah, and size. in a way modern capitalism is built upon the notion that we will never run out correct and right. therefore it's false and wow. therefore it has to stop. You're a cheery fellow. I am a cheery fellow, <laughs> but the, the good news is that when you face that kind of existential crisis, we can change. If I had told you typewriters were going to go or, you know, um, newspapers are going, etc., I mean, we do change. We change all the time. We have to change our economy so it does have jobs, it does have pleasure, it does make our lives better, but it can't be built on more and more consumption of physical resources. We have to have a circular economy. We have to close the loop. We have to do things in a different way. It doesn't mean we don't have a good life. It doesn't mean we don't have growth in the economy and satisfaction and quality of life, etc. But the idea that, you can always, that we can have 7 billion people shopping like we shop, eating like we eat, without any, dis any, any regard for the consequences, of course, is delusional. And, and delusions, in the end, you know, have to be called to account. What do the cracks look like? What do the cracks in the, in the, in the status quo look like? Look around. I mean, yeah. you know, Syria, um, yes, there's a, there's a kind of nasty guy running Syria, but there's also a really bad drought, which caused instability and people to leave. We have the Arab Spring caused by food crises, caused by wheat prices, caused partly by climate change. We have <clears throat> all these system pressures that are building up. Inequality, I mean, Trump is not the problem. Trump is a symptom of the fact that the economy no longer serves the bulk of the people. That's an inequality issue. That's a sustainability issue. You can't have endlessly increasing inequality. You have to address it. What's the time scale then? Well, I, think, I think it's happening around us now. It's, it's like the... But it, it, well, a fix, the time scale of fixing things, because the, the, you need to reinvent yeah. the global economy. And that's where you get into my kind of basic uh, sort of thesis of how we're going to respond, is we wait for the crisis to erupt. You know, here we are in London, World War II. Hitler didn't become a threat when he invaded Poland. Sure. Hitler was a threat long before that. We woke up at that point and reacted, and then we did extraordinary impossible things in hindsight. You know, in the face of impossible needs to reform the whole industrial manufacturing system for the war effort. Unbelievable what was achieved. Extraordinary achievement and incredibly good outcome in that case. Likewise in this one, there is no kind of too late in the sense that we can't overcome it. But the pain of change gets more and more. So my kind of call is like, we're going to change. We're not going to keep on warming the planet until it cooks. We are going to respond. But the sooner we respond, the better our economy is, the, the smoother the transition is, the less disruption there is. And that's the whole point about calling the book The Great Disruption. It's yeah. not like the end of civilization. It is the end of doing things this way 
things are disrupted, we change and we make a better life and we make a better world, a better economy. And that's the opportunity of acting earlier rather than later, but kind of earlier is running out of time. Well, what's the biggest obstacle to this? Because uh, I'm thinking about getting the message out there. You're a great example of, of, of modern technology and, uh, and more traditional media. You write books, but you also give these speeches that, that mm -hmm. go viral on the internet and stuff like that. And yet... I mean, it used to be the means of production, didn't it, that determined who was in charge. Now it's almost the, the medium that is the message, and, and most of the media is controlled by people who won't like your message well, because they're doing very well out of the way things are. Thank you very much. Yes and no. So yes, absolutely, for traditional media and the Murdochs, etc. Um, there's no question, though, that the sort of uh, distributed media of, of social media allows us to change much faster. So an idea spreads in a lightning speed. But so do bad mm. ideas. So so the Trump Correct. movement is, is, is got a lot of support on social media as well, and you can go on board and find that people who endorse your own post-fact world view. Correct, but also the good ideas also spread as fast, and yeah, that's our okay. choice. Yeah. And that's our choice. The thing is, we are choosing, yes, we can go into collapse and decline, or we can go into a more empath empathetic society. That's a choice that we make, and, and my sense is that we are you know, a bit like Sanders versus Trump. They're both disruptive, they're both saying the system is broken, but with very different solutions. And, it's, and, they're, and they're kind of 50-50. It's not like Trump is dominating He's dominating the media. Sure. He's not dominating what people think in America. Like there is a sort of half of them supporting him, half of them supporting a Sanders type alternative. So we're ready for change. We need the right leadership, the right context to, to allow that change and, to happen. And we, we've got it going on in British politics. I know you've only yeah. been here for a week, but the current leader of the Labour Party is speaking up for an awful lot of people who just feel that things have gone over the cliff, as it were, that, 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 that you need now to have a complete redrawing, yeah. a complete rethinking of the ways of doing things. And he's getting something of a kicking from the media and, and uh, even from his own colleagues. But are these the people at the vanguard of political well, change? I, I think disruption is, is a good thing in that sense. It's unpleasant for the current kind of people in charge of yes. everything, but the disruption causes us to think more deeply about what needs to happen and then be ready for that big change. And that, I think, is the good thing about the, the chaos of Trump or in, in, you refer to the UK political kind of upheaval or key of recent weeks, you know, that, that is like, hey, well, let's think deeply about this. How can we do things really differently that really does serve the people? We, we, I've barely scratched the surface. I could listen to you all day. And, and I know a lot of people listening now will feel the same. They can get your book, The Great Disruption. You, you've got a website as well. Yep, that's my name, paulgilding.com. Paul Gilding with an I. Yep. And, uh, and, and the TED Talks are there yeah. as well and all Correct. that sort of thing. And, yeah. and where do you go next? What does Paul Gilding's life look like? Are you well, going back to Tasmania? I live in Tasmania on a farm in the far south of, of Australia, which is a very pleasant place to live. <laughs> um, and I have a I have a nice life and bring up my kids and, and travel the world saying, come on, guys, let's wake up. Let's the get way, to work. The way things are going in Britain and America, Paul Gilding, I'm wondering if you've got a spare room. <laughs> we shall, uh, we'll talk again. I'd love to talk yeah, a little more length next time. It's been a real pleasure. Paul Gilding, as you've heard, you can access his website, just punch his name into Google and find out more about this book, The Great Disruption, which was described by uh, Tom Friedman, or rather prompted Tom Friedman in the New York Times to write, ignore Gilding at your peril. Well, we haven't. It's coming up to one o'clock.